Former President Trump holding his first campaign rally since a gunman opened fire on him last weekend as he was speaking to a crowd in Butler, Pennsylvania. You are looking at video of that assassination attempt that left four people shot, including the former president. Do you want to pop this up for you right now as Fox's Brian Yenis now reporting that a Secret Service counter sniper took the shot that killed the gunman, Thomas Matthew Crooks, saying that he could only see Crooks' scope and the top of his eye and forehead because of the slant of the roof. Yenis saying it was all described to him as a, quote, one in a million shot. In the meantime, several investigations are now underway to determine how this happened and the motive behind the attack with the head of the Secret Service set to testify next week in front of Congress. To get some perspective on all of this, I do want to bring in Jillian Snyder. She's the Policy Director of Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties at the R Street Institute, a retired NYPD officer and an adjunct professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, first off, I do want to talk about the overall investigation, because how does the FBI work an investigation like this into something that is so high profile? The FBI is going to serve as that independent agency that investigates not only the actions of the Secret Service, but also all of the local law enforcement officers that were detailed to that rally. So the FBI is going to play a pivotal role in trying to reconstruct what happened and understand where things went wrong. From an investigative standpoint, how does it differ overall when the suspected gunman is deceased, like in this case, versus when the suspect is still alive? Because I imagine there is the opportunity, the chance to release more information if the gunman is no longer alive. Well, in an ideal situation, we would have the opportunity to speak to the suspect and to debrief them and to get a motive and understanding of why they did what they did. But in cases like this, where you have an active shooter, someone who is attempting to take out someone in this big forum, most of the time that individual will either kill themselves or they will have suicide by cop or, you know, law enforcement will kill them to neutralize the threat. So it's it's kind of difficult to understand um, what we can get out of this because we're just now interviewing people, interviewing his family, doing a deep dive into his social media, into his gaming profile. That is how we're actually gonna understand the motive and the mindset of this individual. Whereas if he was still alive, we would have the opportunity to at least talk to him. And there are still a lot of questions. It has only been one week, so the investigation really just getting going here. But we do know from federal investigators that uh, the suspect here, the shooter, had actually used his father's gun. That is the understanding that just about everyone has here. So my question for you, is it possible overall that the parents are in some way charged here? Do we even have an initial idea on that? As of right now, what I've heard is the family and the parents are being very cooperative in their investigation. I don't foresee any criminal charges being filed against the parents. Um, to my understanding, that rifle was purchased legally. Um, so I think at this point, law enforcement should just be working with the family to better understand the motive and the opportunity, how it presented itself. But I don't foresee charges being brought forth against the parents. When something like this happens, you kind of talked about social media. You do see people who post all over social media, whether it's Facebook, X, just about everywhere with some real information, but also some incorrect information, very incorrect. So how difficult is that for investigators when you see some of these uh, posts that are clearly not real? Unfortunately, when people post things that are inaccurate or they're just trying to get their name in the game and post something so someone reads it, that really hinders law enforcement's investigative efforts because what law enforcement is trying to do is get factual and credible information as fast as they can because the American public really wants to understand why this occurred. So when individuals are just posting nonsense essentially online, the law enforcement community still has to investigate that and make sure that that is not a credible or factual statement because otherwise we would not know what we're doing. We need people to post real-time factual information in order for us to investigate crime.
And this is on that same note here because a post on a popular gaming website was initially attributed to Crooks saying, quote, July will be my premiere. Watch as it unfolds. And it actually does appear that was possibly a fake post. So on that same note, do the fake posts make it difficult? But also, can someone be charged for writing a post and pretending that it was from the shooter? If law enforcement really wanted to try and investigate every fake post, yes, I think that they could ultimately try and bring some kind of hindering prosecution or hindering in a police investigation, but I don't think that they have time for that right now. What they really want is, what's very bizarre to me is this individual was 20 years old. 20 year olds these days, they have a pretty high level of social media interaction on X, on all of the other platforms. This individual seems to have not had that high of a prevalence on social media, hence why we're a week out and we haven't heard that much about who his friends are, what he does for fun. So I think that people coming out there and putting out these fake tweets and these fake quotes and saying that they spoke to him through a gaming platform when it's not real, they are just slowing down the investigation. And I don't know if you can necessarily speak to this, but we know that in the coming week, we are going to see the head of the Secret Service uh, testify there in front of Congress. There's at least two days in two different committees of testimony, and the Secret Service head has said she will be there. However, the FBI leader uh, was asked to go as well and said no. My question, we know why the Secret Service, the head of the Secret Service would uh, need to testify there, but why the head of the FBI? What they're looking for, um, and again, this is my early assumption because we're still very early in this investigation, the FBI is going to serve as that that organization that figures out what went wrong and why. They are going to reconstruct the scene. They are going to interview everyone. They are going to talk to people that were at the rally. They are going to piece together little by little, how did this happen? Why did it happen? What protocols were not followed? Where was there a breach? Where was there a vulnerability that went unnoticed? And that's their role here. So it would really be premature to have the FBI even speak next week because their investigation is months. It's going to take months to figure this out. My last question for you here. Do you think that the public, myself, you as well, will ever get a clear answer here about how this was able to happen and what really happened, including a real motive? The motive is the problem here because I, as well as Americans at large, want to know why this happened. Um, we haven't seen anything like this in over four decades. And this was a young individual, uh, again, not a huge profile. Um, he didn't come out and make any threats. It doesn't seem like anyone in his community really recognized him as a potential threat. Um, in cases like this, once you kind of look at it in the aftermath, most people would say, oh, we kind of suspected this. Oh, we kind of figured that would happen. Oh, this individual acted in a way in which we felt like he might do something. We are not seeing that right now, which is even scarier to the American public, because why? Why did he do this? Hopefully we find out. But more importantly, I think that we as citizens, as well as me as a former law enforcement officer, I want to understand where there was a disconnect in communication. In this situation, the Secret Service would be in charge of this detail. This was a political rally. The Secret Service owns that. They are supposed to work collaboratively with local law enforcement. But in the end of the day, they are the ones that own the protection of the former president, as well as all rally goers. So I think it's going to take many, many months. But I do ultimately think the FBI will do a really great job and figure out where there was a breakdown in protocol. Jillian, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and help break it all down. Obviously, we know a lot, but there is still so much to figure out. Anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? Uh, no, I just think we need to, it's very early on. Again, there's going to be months of investigation. And I think at the end of the day, the FBI will give the American public the answers that they're looking for. All right, Jillian Snyder there, Policy Director of Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties at the R Street Institute, retired NYPD officer and adjunct professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Thank you again for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you so much.
And I do want to take you back over to this post here coming in from Brian Yenis with Fox News now reporting that a Secret Service counter sniper took the shot that killed the gunman, Thomas Matthew Crooks, saying he could only see Crooks' scope and the top of his eye and forehead because of the slant of the roof. Yenis saying it was all described to him as a, quote, one in a million shot. We know these investigations are underway, and the head of the Secret Service is set to testify next week on the response. The first testimony expected to take place on Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. You can watch it live, raw, and unfiltered right here on Live Now from Fox.